Good morning. <laughs> I love enthusiasm. <laughs> I would like to say hello this morning and also to wish those who are watching us online the grace and peace of Jesus be with you this morning. There are a couple of announcements in the bulletin. Um, Easter is almost here. It's going to be early this year, which is, it's March. It doesn't feel that way, but it is. Uh, So we're going to have an Easter brunch. If you would like to help with that, there's a sign-up sheet out in the foyer. And also it is time to uh, get ready to stuff some Easter eggs for the smallest of ours. So if you would like to bring some candy that would be suitable to put into eggs, that would be great. There's going to be baskets out by the bunnies. Like the way I did that, basket bunnies. So if you could bring that over the next few weeks, that would be great. Also, if you would like to have an Easter lily in honor or in memory of someone, there is sheets out in the foyer for that as well. Read the rest of the announcements at your leisure, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Please bow with me. Almighty God, on that final ringing note from the bells, we hear your purity And we sense your joy through the beauty of the earth, the sunshine, the music that captures our heart. We thank you for each person who is part of our music program and the way that you uh, send us your love through music that reaches our hearts. Lord, we want to be joyful today and every day. We do rejoice in this day which you have made for us. And help us to be a joy around other people as we work on our relationships. In the name of Christ, amen. Amen. Please stand for our call to worship. God is great and greatly to be praised. God has led us to this place to refresh our souls. God knows us thoroughly and loves us completely. None of us is perfect and without blemish. Yet, God loves us and asks us to be compassionate and responsible in our caring and witness. We are never out of the reach of God's love. Come, worship and celebrate. God is reaching out to you this day.
Please be seated. In the birth, the life, the ministry, the death, and most importantly, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, the power of sin in our world was broken. In our baptism, we are grafted into Christ. How deep, how wide, how pure is the love, the mercy, and the grace of God. of confession. Do you see the wonders of God's creation? Life is moving too fast. We don't have time to waste. Do you know the magnificent love of God? You know what we need. Do you see the needs of others? Our own needs are made of our lives. Do you need to be healed? We are blind just as we are. Really? Have you reached out to others offering healing and hope? Have you dared to admit your need for God's love? In Jesus Christ, God became vulnerable to the world. God will heal you. God will find you and give you comfort. Forgive us, Lord, for our fears. Walk with us, heal and protect us. In Jesus' name we pray. God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Hear then Christ's word of grace to us. Our sins are forgiven. Came to bring peace among us. Let us sow the seeds for peace in our world by sharing the peace of Christ with one another, stranger and friend alike. The peace of Christ be with you. Let's bow in prayer. Please bow with me. Almighty God, we ask for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit. We pray that you would sweep through the sanctuary, that you would be with those who are watching us online wherever they are. 
We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit uh, opens our minds, opens our hearts, helps us to put aside the things that worry us so that we can focus on what you would have us learn today, learn through your word spoken and sung, through community and fellowship. Lord, I pray that I speak your truth, that that truth sets us free. I pray that we take all that you have poured into us, Lord, and we turn around and we pour that into the world, into those who are hurting and lost, lonely, that we represent Jesus Christ in all that we do and all that we say. Amen. Amen. Our New Testament reading is from Romans 15th chapter, verses 1 through 7. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. This is the word of the Lord.
Our Old Testament scripture for this morning is out of Genesis in the third chapter. We are looking at the first 15 verses. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will certainly not die, the servant said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And then both of their eyes were opened, and they realized that they were naked. And so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put there, put me put with me here, she gave me some of the fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What have you done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. This is the word of the Lord. Well, welcome back to Rick Warren's Transformed Campaign. This week we are looking at how to make our relationships healthier, how to make them better. And to do this, we went back to the very first book of the Bible and to the very first couple, Adam and Eve. Why? Because that's where all of our problems started. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Eve. God made Adam and put him in this paradise, the Garden of Eden, a perfect place. Adam had everything he could possibly want, except he was lonely. He noticed that all the other animals had mates and there was no one for him. And so in love, God created Eve and things got along really well because there was no sin or brokenness. There was no sickness or suffering, no lying, no manipulating, no jealousy. None of these things were in their relationship. But then you know the story. Satan comes to Eve and says, did God really say you can't eat from anything in the garden? No trees? And of course, God never said that. He said, the only tree you couldn't eat from was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then the devil goes on to say, God is lying to you. You're not going to die if you eat of that fruit. You're going to become just as smart as God. And doesn't every temptation come down to basically that issue? We want to be in control we want to run our own lives. You notice Satan never says, oh, do this and you'll just be like me. We know better than that. But we think we know what's better for us than what God knows. 
But when we don't follow God, does it work out well for us? In this story, we see three fundamental fears that pop up in every single relationship. In the back of your bulletin, you will find an outline if you'd like to fill in the blanks and follow along with us. We're going to look at relationships. Relationships in marriage, with friends, at work, anywhere, at church. There are three fundamental things that happened when sin entered the world. They're still in our life, in your life. They damage and they destroy potential in relationships. And the first fear is the fear of exposure. When we're afraid of being exposed, we keep our distance from people. Because we don't want them to find out the truth about ourselves. And when we're afraid, we think, well, if somebody finds out about me, they're not going to accept me. So I'm just going to put up the wall. And if I put up the wall, people won't see my blemishes or my mistakes or my failures or my weaknesses. And so we keep people at hand's length. But Genesis 3, 9 through 10 says, God called Adam and said, why are you hiding? And Adam said, I was afraid because I was naked and so I hid. Whenever God asks a question, it's not like he doesn't know the answer, right? He's asking the questions for our benefit. The question here from Adam was for Adam's benefit because he wants Adam to expect, accept responsibility for the fact that he ran away and was hiding. Transformation in any area of our lives, including our relationships, only happens when we own up to the fact that they're not always what they ought to be. Because fear makes us want to hide. So we pretend we don't have problems or issues in our relationships so we don't have to face the truth. But God wants us to be truthful in our relationships and he wants us to face our fears. In the context here, to be naked is more than just physical nakedness, it's emotional nakedness as well. To be naked means to be exposed, it means to be vulnerable. Adam is already hiding. And there's some pretty specific things that fear does to damage our relationships. Fear brings shame. Once Adam and Eve disobeyed God, the first thing that entered their relationship was shame. Verse 7 says they suddenly felt shame in their nakedness. Shame is what makes us self-conscious. It makes us afraid of being found out and of being humiliated, and so we avoid it at all costs. Fear makes us want to cover stuff up, conceal who we are. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves up. Today, we have much more sophisticated ways of covering up who we really are. Some people use humor. They're the class clown, but they don't let anybody get close to them. Or we try to present an image to the world that we're all together. We have the right clothes, we drive the right car, we do the right things. We do it out of fear. A lot of people hide who they are on their online image. If you look at their Facebook or their Twitter or their Instagram, and it looks like they have a perfect life. But that's not true, no one has a perfect life. And we need to stop pretending we do. Fear makes us distant from God. They hid from God among the trees. I'm afraid to say who I really am because you might not like me. And then I'm up a creek without a paddle. But I'm also now hiding from God. So not only are we disconnected from people, we're now disconnected from God. Not only are we starting to fear other people, we're starting to fear God. God never expects us to be perfect, but he does expect us to be honest. The second fear is fear of disapproval. And the fear of disapproval makes us defensive. 
We move from hiding and running to starting attacking other people. We're not just excusing our own behavior, we're accusing other people. And it's at this stage, when we have these deep-seated fears, we like to point our fingers at everybody else. If you see someone who's incredibly critical or hostile or putting other people down, then you probably know that that person has some deep-seated fear of disapproval because that's the way it shows up. When God asked, did you eat what I told you not to eat? Adam said, you gave me this woman and she gave me the fruit, so I ate it. Adam's not even blaming Eve at this point. He's blaming God. You gave me the woman. She got me all messed up. He's blaming God for his choice. He's passing on the responsibility. But Eve is not any more willing to accept responsibility. In Genesis 3.13, Eve says, It was the serpent who did it, and I ate it. Fear of disapproval makes us defensive people. And fear of losing control, number three, makes us demanding. Adam and Eve had lost control. They had lost everything. They have been kicked out of paradise. And now they're feeling totally out of control because they were. The more out of control you feel, the more controlling you become. We start demanding and demeaning other people and defending. You know, when you're a secure person, you don't have to have your way all of the time. So what is the antidote? What is the solution? What is the way forward in facing these fears? Well, the antidote is to live in God's love. 1 John 4, 18 says, wherever God's love is, there is no fear. So you want to get rid of fear in a relationship? You have to get infused with God's love. Wherever God's love is, there is no fear. Why? Because God's perfect love drives out all fear. The opposite of fear is not faith. The opposite of fear is love. When you invite love into the front door of your heart, remember we talked about that last week, that your heart is where your emotions are? When you ask for God's love in your heart, then fear goes out because fear and love can't live together and perfect love casts out all fear. So how do we learn to live on the day-to-day in God's love? We need to remember the way that God loves you because if you don't feel loved by God, you're certainly not going to love other people. If you don't feel loved, you're not going to be loving. But we can remind ourselves every day what God thinks about you. Not what you think, not what the world thinks, but what God thinks about you. So let me give you a couple of things that God thinks about you. I am completely accepted. This is so important because the wounds in our lives are there mostly because of rejection. And we spend a lot of our time trying to earn acceptance and avoid rejection from our parents or our peers, people we respect, even total strangers, because we want their respect. We want to be accepted. There's a myth out there that says, if I could be perfect, then everyone would like me, right? I hate to tell you this, but Jesus was perfect, and not everybody liked him, right? No matter who you are or what you do, there's going to be somebody who doesn't appreciate it or like it. But the issue of our acceptance has already been settled by God. The Bible says in Titus 3, 7, Jesus made us acceptable to God. Jesus, what he did on the cross, 
is the way we are accepted by God. You are completely accepted. You are unconditionally loved. God loves you unconditionally. There are a lot of things that you can say about God's love for us. But two things that you can say are is that it is consistent and it is unconditional. God's love for you is not unpredictable. God doesn't say, I'm going to love you today, but maybe not tomorrow because I'm having a bad hair day. It's always unconditional. God doesn't say, I'll love you if. He doesn't say, I'll love you because. He says, I love you, period. You can't make God stop loving you. God will never love you more than this very second. And he will never love you less than this very second. And no one will love you more than God already does. It's not based on what you do. It's based on who he is. And we get into trouble when we doubt God's love. And when we doubt God's love, what creeps in? Fear. Isaiah 54.10 says, My love for you will never end, says the Lord. I am completely accepted, and I am unconditionally loved. And then we are totally forgiven. Why are we holding on to the bad stuff when we are totally forgiven? Do you realize that even before God made you, he already knew the screw-ups that you would do and he still chose to love you and create you? Because of what Jesus did. By dying on the cross for us, we are totally forgiven, no longer separated from God. And Romans 8 says it most clearly, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Our sins are wiped out. They are white as snow. God doesn't hold on to them, but sometimes we do. And then we are considered extremely valuable. What makes something valuable? Two things. It depends on who owns it and what somebody is willing to pay for it. And that's what determines value. Who do you belong to? Who owns you? God does. And this is what the Bible says about you. You've been bought with a price and paid for by Christ's death. Jesus paid for you for your life with his life. And that's how valuable you are. But what do we do? Every day, we're called to offer our love to other people. The same love that God has given to us, we need to offer to the people who we come in contact with every day. John 13, 34, Jesus says this, I'm giving you a new command to love each other, to love each other in the same way that I have loved you. This isn't an option. This isn't a kind suggestion. If you are a follower of Christ, this is what we are commanded to do. To love in the same way we are being loved. And that means we accept people completely. We love them unconditionally. Forgive them totally. And consider them valuable. That last sentence will transform every one of your relationships. Accept people completely, love them unconditionally, forgive them totally, and consider them extremely valuable. What do we do with things we find valuable? We protect them, we guard them, we nourish them, we hold them close. The Bible says in Romans 15, 7, accept one another as Christ has accepted you. For those who are following along in your outline, circle the word as. Love one another as Christ has accepted you. In other words, the same way. I value everyone the way Jesus values me. 
And the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, 7, love never stops being patient. Love never stops believing. Love never stops hoping. Love never gives up. And that is how God loves you. God never stops being patient with you. God never stops believing in us. God never stops hoping for the best in your life. God never stops giving up on us. And that's what God expects us to do for other people. We all have complicated, broken relationships that are not the best. But we can ask God to help deliver us from our fears. We can surrender our hearts to God. We can accept and believe that we are accepted and unconditionally loved. And then we can turn around and to ask God to help us accept other people the same way that we've been accepted and loved unconditionally. Amen. Amen. If I sing but don't have love, I waste my breath. Every song I bring An empty voice, a hollow noise If I speak with a silver tongue Convince a crowd but don't have love I leave a bitter taste With every word I say So let my life be the proof The proof of your and angelic ecstasy but don't love I'm nothing but the creaking of a rusty gate if I speak God's word with power revealing all of his mysteries and making everything as plain as day and if I have faith to say to a mountain jump and it jumps but I don't love I'm nothing if I give all I own to the poor or even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr but I don't love I've gone nowhere so no matter what I say no matter what I believe, no matter what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. Let my life be the proof, the proof of your love.
Let us give voice to what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Nothing is more powerful than our relationship with God and our prayers that go upward um, for our own sake and for our community and for the world. I would kindly ask you to take the bulletin home and pray for the prayer concerns in it over the week. If you would please bow in prayer with me. Almighty God, we do live in a broken world, yet we desire to have healthier relationships with each other, with you. So we pray, Lord, that you would help take away our fears and help us to be loving and kind in all that we do and all that we say. We pray, Lord, for our world because we are broken. We have hatred and prejudice and war. We pray, Lord, for Ukraine, for the Middle East, for the parts of Africa, for all the different places in our world where there is terrible atrocity. We pray that you would bring your son, the Prince of Peace, to bring hope and healing. We pray for those across our world and in our own country who are starving. We pray for the hungry that they might have food through our generosity. We pray for those who are trafficked. We pray, Lord, that those chains would be broken and there would be justice. We pray for the social service agencies, the missionaries across denominational lines that go into the darkest of places. We pray that they would bring hope, that they would be re-energized and re-nourished in all that they do. We lift up to you our president, the Congress, the judicial branch. We pray for all the men and women who serve on the local, the state, and the national level. Lord, we can only pray that they would have wisdom. Lord, we pray for all those who are being impacted by the wildfires in Texas. We pray that you would put hedge of protection around people and property. We pray for those in the middle of uh, snowstorms that are not predicted, in, uh, particularly in Alaska. Lord, we pray for those who are outside in the cold, who are homeless. We pray, Lord, that they would find shelter and safety. Father, there are so many needs in our country. We pray for those with mental health issues. We pray for those with addiction issues. Lord, we pray that you would break those chains of bondage as well, that you would bring hope and healing. And now in this moment of silence, we lift up to you the things that we struggle with. We pray that you would be with us in our concerns, in our joys, in our hopes. Father, we pray for the Pasha family at the loss of Bob's sister, Lisa. We lift up to you Judy Henderson and her family at the loss of her brother, George. 
Father, we pray that you would be with these friends and family members in their moment of grief and sorrow, that you would bring the reminder that we are a resurrection people in Jesus Christ, that we have the hope of eternal life. We pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that will bring peace beyond what we can understand. We lift up to you Susie and her upcoming surgery. We are thankful that Carolyn Bell is going to be heading home this week. We continue to pray for Judy and for Charlie as they are going through testing. We pray for Jim and Diane at home. We pray for Janetta with so many questions about what needs to be done medically. We lift up to you Catherine and Matt and Sarah. We lift up to you Betty. We pray for Mason. Lord, we ask that you would be with each of these, bringing healing in the name of Jesus, that their lives would be a testimony and a miracle. Father, we ask that you would be with all of the caregivers, those who are there on the front line in the day in and day out. We pray that they would have grace, that they would have stamina. We lift up to you our sister church in Malawi. We pray for her pastor and her congregation, that they may be a light, that they may be effective in their community and in their country. And now, Lord, we pray the way that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now is the time for the giving of our tithes and offerings. If you are visiting with us today, please don't feel obligated to give. Let this worship service be our gift to you.
please be seated. Please be seated. I know this is very un-Presbyterian. We're not decently in order, so gird yourselves. We are now going to pray for the offering. <laughs> Please bow in prayer with me. Almighty God, we should so appreciate all that you have done for us. And sometimes we don't, but today we do. We're thankful for peace and love, forgiveness and mercy and grace. We're thankful for your justice. Lord, in our gratitude, we give you our offering gifts. We do ask that you would bless them, that you would multiply them, that you would help us use them according to all the things that you would have us do in and through John Knox Church. Amen. Amen. This is the joyful feast of the Lord. People will come from north and south, from east and west, in God's kingdom, to sit at this table. All who believe in Jesus Christ are welcome to come to this table. It is not the Presbyterian table. It is the table of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Join me in this prayer of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Out of the wilderness, a voice calls out, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. The waiting is over. God of grace, thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. God of peace, fill us with your Spirit today that we might have the wisdom 
to understand the mystery of this table and the depth and height and the breadth and length of your love for us. We praise you, joining our voices with your people on earth and all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full, full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. On the night that Jesus sat at table with his friends, the disciples, on that night in which he was to be betrayed, he took bread and he asked the Lord to bless it. And then he broke it and he gave it to his friends, the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. And in the same manner, Jesus took the cup saying, this cup is a sign and seal of my covenant, my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Jesus said, whenever you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, you proclaim my saving death until I come again. This morning we will be taking communion by intention. When you feel the Holy Spirit move you, come forward, take a piece of the bread, and dip it into the cup. Will the elders please come forward?
Please bow in prayer with me. Lord, help us to soak in this moment where we have come to your table, where we have understood the sacrifice of your love for us in the death of your son, that we meet your son through the power of the Holy Spirit at this table. We feel the love and the warmth. Help us to take that love. Help us to incorporate it into our lives, into our relationships. And then help us love others. Love those who are lonely. Love those who are in need. Love those who are lost. Love those who need help. And love our enemies. We ask this all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. And if you would please stand. Go out into your day in the knowledge that God loves you, that Jesus the Christ died and rose again for you, that the Holy Spirit dwells in you now and forevermore, and God's people say, Amen. Amen. Amen.